is literally a graphic novel for every genre that you can think of. There are two things these days that bring kids into the library eagerly. One is the internet and the other is comics and graphic novels. Teachers are seeing so many different ways to use these books and use this format as a learning experience and to engage readers, to bring the challenged reader, the reluctant reader, and the gifted reader all onto the same page, so to speak. Graphic novels have exploded in popularity and are flying off many library shelves. At North Carolina's Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, for example, graphic novel circulation has nearly doubled since 2006. And sales in the U.S. and Canada have increased almost five-fold since 2001. Graphic novels span every topic and category imaginable. There's a story for every age group, every audience. We're talking much more than action, science fiction, and fantasy. Think children's stories, early readers, biographies, memoirs, and the classics all transformed into panels and ink. Welcome to Baker and Taylor's Guide to Graphic Novels. We've gathered experts from within Baker and Taylor and throughout the industry to share what's hot in graphic novels and gain some ideas for expanding your library's collection. So why should your library stock graphic novels or expand its collection? First, graphic novels encourage reading at every level. There's a story for everyone. Graphic novels are a gateway to the classics and other forms of storytelling. They're fun and your patrons want them. But we know what you're wondering. What about ratings? How can you know that your graphic novel selections will be appropriate for your patrons? For this, let's hear from superhero librarian and graphic novel champion, Michelle Gorman. You know, ratings are a tricky thing. Um, there's no universal system for ratings, and a lot of librarians have limited funds, and there's only so much money to go around, and they want to get the right books for their collection. So without a universal system, it's a lot of trial and error, it's a lot of buying books, and then having to put them in a different collection. When it comes to ratings, you have to, to learn who you trust. You have to find the reviewers, and you have to find the publishers uh, who have a rating system that you trust. You have to find the, the distributors like Baker and Taylor. Um, once you find something that you trust, you stick with it. But you also have a community of librarians that are out there. There's something called the Graphic Novels and Libraries Listserv. And 700 librarians, if you have a question, you know, you sit down, you type it in, and you'll get answers from dozens of librarians who are in the same position as you. It's kind of like a soup label. A soup label will tell you what's in it. It won't tell you whether or not it's good for you. So you get to make the decision as a consumer. So basically with the Tokyo Pop rating system, you flip it over on the back and it will tell you what's in that book that gave it the rating so you can make educated decisions for your, for your patron base. So if you don't read a lot of graphic novels, you're looking for the resource that you trust. Um, School Library Journal has a blog called Good Comics for Kids. They do a great job of including information about uh, violence and nudity, things that may, it may trigger, things that may you know, not fit for your community. Um, I write a column for Library Media Connection, which is for school librarians, and I try really hard to make sure that I'm making a note of something. If it's language, um, if it's a sexual content, I may say something like, this is for more liberal collections due to language or violence. Um, I think that there are other websites out there that are written by teachers, um, other librarians, but really, going back to the graphic novels and libraries listserv, it's an opportunity to get feedback from your peers who have the books in their collection. Every day, expert buyers and merchandisers at Baker & Taylor carefully screen new graphic novel titles and assign ratings by audience. Ratings are divided into five sections. The first is all ages, or books generally acceptable for children. Children is for ages five through nine. These contain comic type violence. Tween is ages 10 through 14. These have non-sexual, mild, but not graphic violence. Teen is for ages 15 and up. These may have mild but not gratuitous violence and scantily dressed characters. Mature may contain strong violence, nudity, profanity, and slurs. What we want to know is, are these ratings helpful to you? How could we make it easier for you to order graphic novels with complete confidence? We're planning to review and possibly adjust how we rate graphic novels, and your feedback can guide the process. You'll find a detailed copy of Baker & Taylor's ratings available for download at the end of this webinar and an email address for leaving your feedback. Now on to some of the hottest trends in graphic novels. Here again is Michelle Gorman talking about graphic novel adaptions of the classics. 
the thing about classic stories is they're great stories. They're classics for a reason. They have great characters. They have great plot development. They really pull you in. But the problem is that the classics can be really difficult to read. Uh, in my workshops around the country, I'll ask the question, who's read Moby Dick? Who's read Billy Budd? And you'd be surprised how many hands don't go up. And so what that tells me is that we expect kids to read the classics, but we're not reading them ourselves. And there's a reason why we're not reading them. And so for me, graphic novel adaptations of classic literature are a gateway to stories. I think they provide them with an introduction to the story and to the characters. They give them an entryway to the story and it allows them to feel comfortable with the story. There's a lot of librarians that aren't sure about the classic adaptations. They're not sure how they'll fit in the classroom. They're not sure how the teachers will respond to them. And I was actually doing a workshop in upstate New York all librarians and a teacher in the back says you mind if I say something and I'm like sure come on up and she comes to the front of the room and she tells this story about the Beowulf adaptation by Gareth Hines she actually bought the copies with her own money paired them with the original verse poetry and said she's never seen students as engaged with the story as she was when she did it this way she actually for the first time walked into the classroom and saw her students before class had even started making comparisons holding the book and holding the graphic novel and talking about it actually arguing about Grendel's mom that's what I think classic adaptations can do. They give a new life to stories that can be difficult. Diamond Book Distributors is a leader in graphic novels. John Shableski is a well-known speaker and industry expert. He joins us from Diamond to discuss another top trend, biographies as graphic novels. We've got a great amount of progress that's taking place with the uh, with the uh, genres as far as biographies and memoirs and it really dates back to one of the ones that well, actually the book that really opened the doors for us is Mouse by Art Spiegelman you know Art picked up the uh, special Pulitzer back in the early 90s for that and after that you had major books like Blankets from Craig Thompson and then uh, that follows with American Born Chinese and uh, by Gene Yang which is a brilliant book not too far after that, Fun Home from Alison Bechtel was the uh, time book of the year, and Stitches most recently has been a real big book for us as far as opening up the category even more. You've got more and more authors who are stepping out and creating these books and feeling encouraged by the success of, of books like uh, Fun Home and American Born Chinese. Uh, what's most common with the biographies and, and memoirs that you're seeing these days is it's a story that's written and drawn by the author. Uh, more often than not, historically, comics and graphic novels have been created by a team of artists and writers and pencilers and inkers. In this case, this is somebody who's put their own words and their own images down on, on the page, and it's turned out to be a much more intimate experience than what you would get, say, with um, a story like Watchmen. Oh gosh, as far as favorites goes, uh, I'd have to say American Born Chinese by Gene Yang. Blankets by Craig Thompson is a brilliant book, and actually it's one of the first real strong graphic novels as far as the memoir category goes. Um, brand new is a book by Tracy White called How I Made It to 18. I think it's a really brilliant book, and I can see a lot of good things happening for that book this year. You know, I think there's a misnomer out there that graphic novels are for boys. And that's something that we're dealing with, we have been dealing with for a decade. Um, and what we're seeing now is a new generation of female comics, but also stories that resonate with young women, coming of age stories, stories about girls dealing with issues, dealing with relationships. I think we are seeing more titles come out for young women. I think the publishers and the, the artists and creators finally said, you know what, there is an audience for this. Um, there's a book that's coming out in November called Hereville. And it's about a young 11-year-old Orthodox Jewish girl who grows up in an Orthodox Jewish community and she wants to fight dragons. It is, it's magical realism at its best and it's the kind of story that brings religion to life and it's something you just don't see very often, but it has such heart. Well, there's a new book that came out at the beginning of this year. It's called Smile by Raina Tegelmeyer and it's fantastic. I read it and thought this is gonna be one of the top books of the year and it has just garnered some serious award and acclaim. Um, it's a story about a young girl. It's actually an autobiography. It's her story. Uh, it's called, the subtitle is called A Dental Drama. And it's about a young girl, Raina, who fell, knocked her teeth up, and then ended up having to go through all of this orthodontia. Um, that, that a lot of pain, a lot of misery, a lot of dealing with her peers, the braces forever. Um, and what it does is it brings the reality of braces 
this to life. There are tons of young women and men out there that are dealing with this at a young age. And it says, you know what, I did this too. I've been there. Um, she lived in San Francisco at the time, so there's the earthquake, she, and it's how it affected her. It's how her family and her friends just growing up during that time. And it's so real, and it has a lot of heart to it. And it was actually, Raina actually did the Babysitter's Club adaptations a couple of years ago, which were some of the highest circling graphic novels at the time, which was really a surprise to me. But what it tells me is that there are young women out there that are looking for these books, that are visual learners. And we just need to make sure that we're choosing books that are just as appealing for young women as they are for young men. Graphic novels for early readers are also increasingly popular. In fact, sales of kids and young adult graphic novels increased by 50% between 2001 and 2009. Meet Francoise Mouly, art director of The New Yorker, who in 2008 launched a line of early reader graphic novels called Toon Books. Well, the goal is to get kids to fall in love with books uh, and with reading and with the fact of being immersed in a book. And I found out how great comics and graphic novels were firsthand with my own children when they were at that age, that a book is interesting when an adult reads it to you, but a comic no uh, graphic novel is immersive. And later on, I found out from talking to educators and to Dr. Sversky, who was a professor of psychology at Stanford and at Columbia, the scientific reason why kids love comics. And it's because um, comics are multimodal. You get information not just from what the words say, but also from the facial expression, the gestures that the characters make, um, the, the sound effects, the onomatopoeias, the context, uh, the visual information that is given to you. And all of this gives you a very emotional uh, telling of the story. Now, when you have that combined with simplified vocabulary, you have an excellent point of entry for the child into a book. Um, as my husband, Art Spiegelman, cartoonist at uh, Dead Mouse says, this is a gateway drug for literacy. Uh, this is a way that children can learn to love being immersed in, um, in reading and in being into books. Well, with Toon Books specifically, so we did this whole collection of early readers and um, we developed our own system because we were basically breaking ground. There was no uh, model to follow. So what we did is that we took the books to in draft in rough draft form, we took the scripts, the manuscript, two kids in school, and they're surprisingly able to read rough sketches to kids. They can interpret, they can um, do the inference and the connections between one panel and the next that is needed to make meaning uh, happen from printed, drawn, uh, written words. So we take the manuscript to young children in kindergarten or pre-K or first or second grade, and then we read it with them, we let them read it aloud, and then we note discreetly the part where they uh, misread and the part where they have, um, they jump to the wrong panel, and then we rework with the artist. All the artists that we work with are willing to do this very arduous work. We rework the mechanics of the storytelling in such a way that it's fluid and transparent and then by the time we have the finished book in place the kids just basically can't stop reading they can't stop turning the pages and video games continue to influence sales of graphic novels where there's a game like starcraft world of warcraft or halo there's often a graphic novel Movie tie-ins are also big. Let's hear again from John Shableski. The movie and television industry have actually been quite uh, closely related to the graphic novel and the comics medium since the uh, 30s and 40s and 50s. There were comics that were being done as radio uh, theater. And then with the move to television, Superman, of course, took off in a big, big way. The movie industry really didn't start picking up until the late 60s with Barbarella as a, as a movie. A couple of movies in the 70s with Superman. 
the 80s, we started to see more movies being produced to 12 movies for the decade of the 80s. In the 90s, it was around 46. And in the first decade of this new century, we had over 87 movies that were born from the graphic novel and the, and the comic book format. And it's, it's not surprising to see that because like you've had with the educational world and the library world, these creators and these movie producers grew up reading comics and are now in these decision-making roles. And it's kicking in at the tune of around, just in ticket sales alone, $17 billion that, uh, that the movie industry has produced with movies born from comics and graphic novels. And that's just tickets, that's not DVDs, that's not merchandise. And I know that number may sound a bit crass for some people that, because it is, it's a dollar stat, but that also tells you about the amount of awareness that the overall marketplace has for all these storylines, whether it's Spider-Man on pencils or underwear or book jackets or the comic book or the movie. Um, that's, it's a trillion dollar a year industry and it's, it's a phenomenal thing that has now really started to hit. I think Maine's, it, it's, I think it's starting to hit full stride. Do you plan to stop me yourself? There was a time when you called yourself my friend. The Owen is mine! Why are you trying to go this alone? This doesn't concern you, so forget it. The relationship between graphic novels and video games is almost identical to that of the movie industry and graphic novels and comics. And you're finding that movies these days that are coming from video games also have a book that goes along with them. Halo is one that we're waiting for as a movie, already has a graphic novel series out and is a phenomenon as far as video games go. Um, Tomb Raider is one that was a successful movie franchise as well as a video game and there's books that go along with that as well. Prince of Persia, a big movie, big production uh, project that came out earlier this year was a graphic novel from first second but before then it was a video game. So uh, the relationship is, like I said, identical to that of movies and graphic novels and again there's so many talented people that are working on the movies who were actually part of either the video game project itself or the writing of the graphic novel. Mainstream authors are also diving into graphic novels. Well, there are a lot of great big name authors who are now coming into the format. Um, as you know, Stephen King has already got a graphic novel series out with uh, the guys at Marvel. Um, Janet Ivanovich and James Patterson are relatively new to this. Dean Koontz is also arriving on the scene with his own graphic novel series. What that does is it creates a greater awareness throughout the general public and the marketplace. Even traditional retail is starting to give greater recognition to the format. And for those directors of library systems and maybe directors of educational systems who were kind of looking sideways at the graphic novel format are now taking it uh, much more seriously because these, these authors like King, like Patterson, like Ivanovich, now they get to tell you what that dark and stormy night really looks like. And there's this great new enthusiasm for writing again for these people in particular. With the arrival of Stephen King, James Patterson, Janet Ivanovich, the, that's pushed the, the first copies, the first print runs of these books to numbers that we've never seen before. Um, originally, before those guys, even 10 years ago, you're looking at a first copy print run of five to 10,000. The publishers didn't have any expectation or understanding of what the book market was going to provide for them. Well, then, you know, you've got Stephen King stepping in, and the first print run for The Stand was around 200,000 copies. Janet Ivanovich, James Patterson, at print runs of 250,000. Um, Stephanie Meyer's Twilight series launches with a 300,000 copy print run, and then just recently, Dav Pilkey announces he's going to do Captain Underpants for Scholastic as a graphic novel, and the first book in a four-book series goes out the door at a million copy print run, which is huge for us. You know what's going to make graphic novels even more engaging? Digital content. If you and your patrons weren't already hooked on graphic novels, Blio will pull you in. Built on video gaming technology and leveraging full color 3D images, Blio, powered by Baker and Taylor, literally brings books to life. 
We can't wait to see what it does for graphic novels. Stay tuned. Graphic novels offer fun reading experiences for all ages. There are a lot of titles to be excited about. If you were scribbling fast, don't worry. We have cheat sheets for you. At the end of this program, please download our ratings guide. And don't forget to email us your feedback on our ratings and how we could better serve you in rating graphic novels. There's also a glossary of graphic novel terms. You'll also find recommended titles for each of the trends discussed in this webinar. And you'll find more about our experts, Michelle Gorman, John Shableski, and Francoise Mouly. Don't forget to also check out Baker and Taylor's quarterly publication called Graphic Novels. To subscribe, go to www.baker-taylor.com and click on subscribe. Thank you for joining us. We're thrilled to offer the first in what we hope is a long and informative series of webinars. If you enjoyed this webinar, please share it with your colleagues. You can also view it again on our webinar archive page. Be sure to check back for more webinars and trend updates from Baker and Taylor. Have a great day.